My 11 year old picked out this first project and really wanted me to make a mini plant ladder. I was going to make it out of scrap wood, but thought it would be perfect using these blocks. I started out gluing four blocks end to end using regular wood glue. This is gonna be the smaller top shelf. Now I wanted my shelves to have a staggered look with the blocks, which required me to cut several blocks in half, but you could certainly make straight stacked rows if you don't have a saw to cut the blocks. And this shelf is four blocks wide by four blocks long. And the second shelf is four blocks wide by four and a half blocks long. Next I made four five block pieces. I figured you don't wanna keep watching me glue blocks together. So here's where we are so far. Now I need to attach two of the five block pieces to make an open bottom triangle. I don't know what you would call that shape, but this part almost caused me to give up on this project. I had to figure out most of it off camera because I was getting so frustrated. I cut the angle way too long and deep so the side wasn't as wide as I wanted it to be. So I cut that top block off, glued a new one on and cut a smaller angle. And that worked great for the first side. But when I tried to replicate it for the second side, I couldn't get the pieces to line up. There was a large gap between the two pieces where I couldn't get glue on enough of the surface. So I had to add a shim to the second side. Once the glue was dried, I cut the tips flat. That way the top of the ladder can sit on it. Okay guys, I have all of my pieces ready to go to build this plant ladder. So we have our little like triangular pieces. These are going to be the sides and then we're going to put our shelves in between here. And then this is the top of our plant ladder. So this is a two by four block. I changed this to be staggered like the shelves and only three blocks wide, but two and a half long. And then we have our two shelves. So one is slightly longer than the other. And then we have our rungs for the shelves to sit on. So I have four of these two block pieces, one by two, I guess we'll call them. <laughs> All right, now we can put everything together and build this piece. I next needed to figure out where the shelves are going to go on the ladder. I don't want to attach the sides directly to the shelves, so that's why I have the rungs. But they're a little too tall, so I cut them down to the height that I wanted and then drilled a pilot hole through the side and down into the rung so the screw doesn't split the wood and attach them together. Getting the second side on was a little bit tricky. My craft table is not level and I always forget that when building projects like this. So the shelf ended up being level lengthwise, but has a slight decline from the front to the back. Then I did the same thing for the top shelf. I'm not sure why I didn't show it. I must have forgot to hit record, but I just used wood glue and attached the top piece. And last, I stained it up with special walnut and that's it for this one. I love how you can make some larger scale projects with these blocks. I ended up using 61 blocks just under the 63 that came in a box. I've had this idea for over a year and just haven't done it yet. I got these chopping mats from the Dollar Tree and they are see-through. One side's kind of frosted looking and the other is shiny. I wanted to decoupage the mat and I grabbed two options from my stash. One's a decoupage paper and the other is a basic tissue paper that was a little bit more colorful. Both options are stunning and very spring feeling, but I thought you could see the print and pattern a little bit better on the blue florals, so I went with that one. Since the decoupage paper wasn't as tall as the chopping mat, I had to cut it down a little bit. I used my X-Acto knife to cut it down and it was really easy to cut through. Guess that wouldn't really make it a good chopping mat though. I then cut the mat in half because I'm making a little light box or a lantern and it needs four sides. Next, I wiped down the surface of the mat. Since we're decoupaging the paper to the back or the shiny side, I wanted to make sure there was no fingerprints or dust that got trapped and you would see them from the other side. I'm gonna use my liquid patina to glue the paper onto the mat, but I actually think Mod Podge or decoupage glue would have been a little bit better for this project specifically. 
Decoupage paper is pretty thick, much thicker than when you use a napkin and the liquid patina dries quickly. I used a fan brush to apply the glue so it would get up, so it would get up under the paper easily and apply the glue to all of the areas. I wasn't thinking when I did this first one, I had wanted to add both mats to the paper before cutting the paper down, but I had only added the one mat at first, so I had to cut this one down, but for the second paper, I added both mats and glued them at the same time. As the glue was drying, I realized I could see some streaks under the paper. It was like the areas that had more glue turned the paper more transparent, and the thinner glue areas stayed whiter. So I went back over top of the whole thing with a layer of the patina. I sanded off all the excess paper and here's why I would have used a thicker glue like Mod Podge. You can see the paper peeling away from all the corners. I had to add more patina to make sure it stays down. Next we need to build the lantern structure. I was able to create a rectangle with the Jenga blocks without having to cut down any of them again. Winning! <laughs> I made four rectangles and then before I added the decoupage mats, I want to paint them. I wanted the lantern to have a ton of texture, so I added baking soda to my paint. And I added a lot of baking soda. The way I like to get the most texture by using this method is by painting the first coat on how you normally would paint something. And then when you add the second coat, or however many coats you want after, you stipple it on. I love this technique. It is kind of hard to tell on camera here, but I'll make sure to get a close up in the reveal. Once the paint was all dry, I'm adding decoupage mats onto the blocks with hot glue. The one thing you want to be cognizant of here is that you are gluing the frosted side down, so that's what you see on the outside of the lantern. That way you don't have the paper texture facing out. Next, I assembled the lantern and glued the all four sides together. I realized after I put everything together, I needed a base for inside of the lantern because I'm gonna add some feet and I need something to put the light on. So I glued some blocks together. They don't fit perfectly on the bottom, but that's okay, you're not gonna see this part. I just painted them white as well, but not with the texture paint. It was a little difficult to get the blocks glued in. I had dry fitted it and it was pretty snug. So of course, when I went to actually glue it in, one side didn't wanna cooperate, but I left it as is. Like I said, you aren't gonna see this part. And last, I grabbed these little feet that I have. I think these are from Hobby Lobby and I glued them onto the base. I like how they looked being in a little bit from the edge. I just love how this project turned out. I think it is so stunning and even more so than I had envisioned. Today I have a few projects using basket weaving reed that are easy to recreate and here's the materials you will need for the first one. The reed of course, which is linked in my description box, I got that from Amazon. Wood glue, I'm using wood glue super glue from Dollar Tree and then binder clips. We're making a tobacco basket here, which I'm so excited about. I've been wanting to make my own for quite a while now. Before we get started, you wanna find a box or something that's the size and shape you want your basket to be. I'm using a 12 by 12 cube storage bin for mine, which made my basket about 14 by 14 inches. So I start out wrapping the reed around the top of the cube and I wrapped it two times. For the second layer, I added wood glue and the binder clips as clamps to hold the reed in shape while it dries. This process does take some time because you need to wait for the glue to harden between each step before moving on.
Once I got back to where the reed started, I cut it off just using scissors. This stuff cuts really easy. Then I set this aside to dry for about an hour. Next, I'm gonna create the cross section you see in the middle of, of the tobacco baskets. Usually they look like a diamond pattern. Now I should have done this a little bit different and I'll explain that, but I cut four strips to the length I wanted that section to be. Then when I went to attach them, this is what I should have done different. I was forcing the end of the reed to sit flat with the edge of the basket, which caused the reed to twist a little bit. I should have laid the, I should have let the reed lay flat and then cut an angle on the end of it. I hope that makes sense. Here's an image I found on Pinterest that shows what I mean. But I got all four pieces on and then glued the cross sections together and set this aside for another hour to dry. Now I can add the woven section. For this, I glued the end of the reed to the top of the basket and then cut where it was needed. I didn't wanna cut all the pieces at once and some end up being too long or too short. This way there was no waste and each piece fit perfectly. I did five strips going each direction, and when I got to the weave portion, I did cut down the first piece, but for the rest, I wove it through the existing pieces, glued down the end, and then it cut the opposite end. I think that's the better way to do this, but you certainly could cut the strips down if you wanna work with a smaller piece. You also wanna make sure to alternate the pieces, so if the first one's starting going over, the next should start under. And don't weave the reed through the diamond section we created first. I let this section dry for another hour and then it cut off any of the pieces that were sticking up higher than the rim of the basket. I started with my scissors, but I did go back in with my box cutter, which made it look much cleaner. Now to clean up the edges where all the strips are glued down, I wrapped the side with another layer of the reed. And then I tacked the center diamond section down to the woven part of the basket because that was starting to stick up a little bit. Next, I sanded down the edges since there's a lot of little frayed bits and was debating staining the basket or leaving it as is. Most tobacco baskets I've seen are a darker wood, so I did end up staining it with my Valspar antiquing glaze. You can find this at Lowe's, and I used a paintbrush and watered it down so it wasn't too dark and got into all those cracks a little easier. That's it for this basket. It is not perfect. I don't love the center design on this one, but it looks pretty good for my first ever basket. I've had these three picture frames in my stash for quite a while now, and I know you can find very similar ones at Dollar Tree. I'm not sure where these ones came from, but I'm gonna remove the backs of these, and then I got out some foam core board. I'm gonna cut around the backing with my X-Acto knife so I have a piece of the foam core board that fits snugly inside the frames. Next, I'm taking some masking tape and I wanna tape off all along the edges. I didn't put the tape directly up against the edge. I wanted to kind of cut the tape in half just to get a white border that was the size that I wanted all the way around the foam core board.
Then I'm taking my moss green paint by Waverly and I'm using a sponge dauber here to apply all over the foam core board. I just really like the texture and the dimension that using a sponge dauber added to the paint rather than using a flat brush. And again, use whatever color makes you happy here and go with your aesthetic. I gave all three foam core boards two coats of the green paint. Then I got out my rub and buff. I really wanted to give these frames more of a vintage type of look. I have the colors antique gold, European gold, and gold leaf. I wanted to see which one I liked against that black frame, so I did a little test section on the back. I ended up going with that antique gold because it felt the brightest against the black frame. The other two felt a little bit more sheer. To apply rub and buff, you can simply just use your finger. It does stain a little bit and you might need to use some rubbing alcohol or something to take it off of your hand with. I like to use a makeup brush here because it's really soft and it blends the rub and buff in nicely. It also helps to spread it a lot farther. I covered all three frames with about one and a half coats of the rub and buff. I didn't want a full coverage here, but wanted that black to peek through in a little bit for an aged look. When I went to remove the masking tape from the foam core board, I should have known it was going to rip off some of that foam core board top. After all, it is just paper as the top layer. And at first I was really upset by this. However, I think it turned out to be a really happy accident because it ended up giving even more of that aged and vintage type of look that I was going for in the first place. So once I stepped back to take a look at how they had turned out, I really loved it. I did just have to touch up one small section where the paper ripped up a little too far. Next, I had cut out a few greenery images with my Cricut machine and I'm gonna weed them out now. So I cut a Monstera leaf and then two basic greenery stem looking images. And of course, you can print out any image that fits your style. Vintage botanical art has been trending for a while and I wanted to recreate that look for myself. Once I got my images weeded, I'm just taking some clear contact paper. I prefer using this over transfer tape. I find that it's a little bit less sticky and doesn't rip off my paint when I'm applying it to the vinyl. I know you can use the t-shirt trick, but I just don't love using that method and really prefer the contact paper. Then I laid my botanical art in the center of the foam core board and removed that contact paper. You could use even larger frames to make this really impactful or create a whole gallery wall for your space in your home. I really love the way these turned out. I just pop them right back in their frame and they're good to go to hang on the wall. I've been wanting to recreate one of these stunning restoration hardware vessels for a while and I'm finally doing it. I've had this large vase in my stash for years, just waiting for the right project and the shape is perfect for this dupe. I cleaned it up with some crud cutter and then grabbed some of my Sculpey air dry clay. Since the rim of the RH vessel was more prominent and rounded and also looked a little bit more handmade and not perfect. So adding the clay will really help achieve that look. I rolled it out into a long snake until it would cover the rim of the vase. And then I slightly pushed it down on top of the vase so the rim indents the clay. You wanna be careful here not to distort the shape of the clay too much. And I used some water to smooth the seam where the edges meet the best that I could. You can see the indent from the rim when I take the clay off to add that glue. And I use my tight bond quick and thick glue to adhere it. This works really well on glass and on clay.
I also made sure to wipe any glue that seeped out of the bottom off. It's okay if you don't get it all because we're gonna be adding several layers to this vessel, but you don't want it to dry with big globs of glue or have it look like drips. Once the glue is dry, I'm painting the whole thing in Coffee Bean by Dixie Belle. This is a rich, deep brown color. I recently bought these large, round, pointed brushes, and I love them for painting surfaces like this. After the coffee bean color dried, I went over that with a bronze by Dixie Belle. This is actually a patina paint, but I'm just using it as a metallic paint and not gonna patina it. The RH vessel looked like the top rim was more of a bronze or a deep metallic color, and then the distressed areas were a deep brown. I thought I'd be able to sand some areas to have both that bronze and the brown show through, but that didn't really work out. It just went straight to that brown color. All right, now it's time for the fun part. Since I bought this big bag of plaster of Paris for my plaster coffee table, I wanted to use the plaster on a vase as well. But I was definitely nervous with how quickly plaster of Paris starts to set. You only have about five minutes to work with it, which doesn't leave a lot of time to just play around. While I love the way this vessel turned out, I would recommend using a joint compound or spackle instead but I mixed up the plaster with one part of cool water to two parts of plaster and started applying it with a two inch chippy brush. I wanted a lot of texture and layers, which is why I used the chippy brush. I didn't cover the vase fully and purposely left areas that showed the bronze underneath. Once that dried, I sanded the plaster to smooth it a little bit and bring out more of that bronze and then repeated this a few times to build up the layers. I was at the wrong place at the right time Cause suddenly there you were with those bright blue eyes We were conversing into the night sky when you took my hand, said, let's leave now. Don't want to be shy. I will let my guard down. Don't want to be shy. I wanted to see some more depth and deeper areas in the plaster that go all the way down to that paint layer. So I grabbed one of my clay tools to start scraping the plaster away. This was awful to do. The sound of the tools on the plaster was like nails on a chalkboard and I had horrible goosebumps the entire time I was doing this, but it was worth it for that look that I wanted. This added more dimension, which is what I was going for. However, I wasn't able to keep the tools from removing the paint layer. It was scraping everything off right down to the glass. So I spray painted the inside of the vase with metallic antique brass. And again, this is adding another layer and another element to the piece. All right, I'm pretty happy with how the base is starting to look. So now I need to figure out how I can get that ridge detail of the top of the vase, similar to the RH one. It took me a few days, but I decided to take some of my Dixie Belle mud and tint it brown. Now, Dixie Belle does make a dark mud, and I should have used that, but I didn't have it on hand. And since the one I was using was already tinted white, it really changed the color of the paint I had added. My mud was also a little bit dried out, so I added some water in with the paint and mixed it all up. It definitely turned more gray than the dark brown I wanted, but it is what it is. I found this icing comb set at the Dollar Tree, and one of the combs has teeth on it that are perfect to get that ridge textured look. So I spread the mud on with a plastic palette knife and then went in an angled motion. And then I combed it out to add that detail. I didn't pay much attention to how far I was dragging the mud down. I wanted it to be very random. And then I let this layer dry. This project does require a lot of dry time in between all of those layers. Next, I took a sanding sponge and lightly sanded the ridges just to knock off any of those sharp spots.
Then I took more mud, untinted this time, and spread it over the base. The RH version also had lines running down the entire vessel. They were more like drip lines from the rice wine that would run down the same spot over and over creating those indents, but I couldn't think of a way to recreate that exact look. So instead of taking the wider side of the comb and just adding some lines into the mud. I also took some of the white mud up onto that grayish brown ridge part so it wasn't so clean looking and again add some more detail, dimension, and layers to this piece. I know it seems like this is a lot of work, but the outcome is just stunning. It's been a while since I've done a vase like this and they are some of my most loved projects, so I hope you enjoyed this one as well. Next wall art project is inspired by a few different floral pieces I've seen. I'm using another 12 by 12 canvas and these lavender floral picks that I got from Hobby Lobby. These florals weren't too expensive like some can be at Hobby Lobby. They were $4.99 a piece. So when you get them on a half off day, that's not too bad. These are the exact silhouette I was looking for for this project. So I cut the stems down into individual pieces. That way I could lay them out how I wanted. Once I had all the lavender laid out how I wanted, I glued the florals down with my Starbond super glue. I didn't want to use hot glue because I thought you would end up seeing that in the end, which isn't what I wanted. This part does take a little bit of time, but I didn't glue every little piece down, just enough so that it would stay in place. Next, I added some of the grass pieces along the bottom for some more dimension. Initially, I wanted this to be coated in plaster, but the more I thought about it, I thought the plaster would end up looking like a mess. Really, all I wanted was the whole piece to be one color, so I decided to spray paint it instead. I used the color Heirloom White, which is a warm, creamy off-white color. I had to give the florals several coats. The paint absorbs into the material of the florals, and I feel like it still could use another coat or two. But that's it for this one. It was pretty easy. On the Pottery Barn website, I found this simple heart framed art piece, which is perfect for my style. I don't really decorate for Valentine's Day and this piece doesn't scream Valentine's to me. And we can make it for way less than $179. I had this old canvas piece that I made a few years ago, but never shared on my channel and I've never used it anywhere. So it's time to get a makeover. First, I need to remove all of that thread that makes up the image. Next, I needed to create a blank canvas and covered the top with two layers of gesso. Obviously, if you have a blank canvas or frame to use, you wouldn't need to take these steps first. All right, while the gesso is drying, I'm gonna mix up some paper mache. This is instant paper mache that you can buy from any craft store or on Amazon. I'll link it in my description box. But all you have to do is add some water and mix it up. I scooped out way too much for this project. You only need a really tiny amount. Once the gesso is dry, I pulled up the Pottery Barn image and sketched out the hearts on my canvas. I highly recommend sketching out any design you're making first because you can always erase your mistakes or fix any areas that don't look quite right before adding on the paper mache. And you do not have to use paper mache to get this look. The Pottery Barn version is made out of resin. You could also use clay or anything that created a moldable 3D design on the canvas. Now we can add the paper mache. I used my spatula and scooped out thin lines of the mache and started adding it right over top of the lines that I drew. Then I used my fingers to shape and smooth it out. 
I kept wetting my fingers so the paper mache didn't stick to my hands while I was molding it. Once the paper mache was all added to the canvas, I set it aside to dry overnight. Then I'm taking the color Buttercream by Dixie Belle to paint the entire thing. The Pottery Barn version is bright white, but I wanted more of a warm off-white for mine, and I gave the canvas and paper mache two coats. Next, I wanna add a frame to take this canvas to the next level and look more high-end, but also to look more like the inspiration. My husband bought me this mini table saw last month for my birthday, and I could not wait to use it. I'll link it in my description box if you're in the market for one as well. But I have these scrap trim pieces from a failed home project and decided to use them here. I just need to miter the corners to create a frame. And this little saw is perfect for a small job like that. Now, when you're cutting trim or molding like this that has a curved detail to it, you actually need to cut it upside down in order for the corners to meet up correctly. So I set my guide to 45 degree angle and cut down all of the sides to fit around my canvas. The height of the saw blade is adjustable, which I forgot about when making these cuts, so it didn't cut all the way through, but I was able to just bend the plastic and snap it right off so it wasn't a big deal. I used hot glue to attach the frame pieces, but you could use something stronger if you choose. I cut the last trim piece a little bit too long and it wasn't sitting quite right, so I went back and cut a tiny bit off, and then the corner didn't line up as nicely as the rest of the frame, but that's okay, I took some spackle and filled in the gap. I painted the frame buttercream as well, although I do think it would look nice white for a little contrast. The Pottery Barn piece was all the same color, so I painted the frame and that's it for this piece. I had all these materials on hand already, so this project didn't cost me anything compared to the $179 price tag of the original. came across these pillar candle holders while scrolling the site. It says they were new about a month ago, but I don't see them on the site anymore. Anyways, as I was looking at them, I was thinking I could easily recreate this shape using a styrofoam cone and a circle, which I already have in my stash. At first, I just glued the cone right down on the circle. However, I realized I wanted to cut the top of the cone off a little bit so there was more surface for that circle to sit on top. Now, I know some of you don't like when I share my mistakes or what I would do different, all I'll say is this is a DIY channel and DIY is not perfect. I will continue to share my trial and error process and being transparent in my videos to help those who do appreciate it from making the same mistakes as I have. Back to the DIY, since the Pottery Barn version is ceramic, I wanted to figure out how I could get the styrofoam to look smoother than it is. I had two different ideas to do this and used both since I'm creating two candle holders to see if one turns out better. On the taller one, I'm gonna use Plaster of Paris. I mixed up the powder and water using a two to one ratio until it was smooth. You only have a few minutes to work with this stuff, so I had to work pretty quickly. I thought I could get a smooth look by pouring it over the cone. This worked out pretty well. It is not perfectly smooth, but I was able to sand it down once it was dry. The second method I tried was joint compound. I didn't want to completely cover the cone with joint compound, but I added way too much at first. So I took my spatula and just kind of spread it over the surface to fill in all of those holes and removed all of the excess. Like I said, the plaster didn't turn out perfectly smooth, but it wasn't too bad. 
I sanded down both the plaster cone and the joint compound cone to get them smoother. Although you could also get a smooth surface by covering the cones with poster board and save yourself all of this time and effort. Next, I painted all of the pieces with white paint. All right, now we can attach the circles back to the cones. I measured the sides this time to make sure I glue the cone down right in the center. Since this is a pillar candle holder, you want to make sure it's centered so the circle doesn't break off under the weight. Once I found the center, I marked it with a Sharpie and then I used my Starbond super glue to attach the pieces together. This gives them a really secure hold. Now to add the design, the Pottery Barn piece looked like watercolor and I bought these watercolors from the Dollar Tree a while back. The blue in this kit wasn't the right shade that I was looking for, so I'm using another blue I had and mixed the black watercolor to get a deep blue. You wanna add a lot of water to this paint to get that wash of color and not so saturated. Pro tip, if you need to add a straight line onto something, figure out how high you want that line to be. I'm using a paint container and put your project on a turntable. Then you can hold your hand and the brush stationary and spin the object to get a perfect straight line. Then I added in the decorative pattern along the bottom. I like to use a pointed paintbrush here to get that variation in the lines a little bit easier. I'm not the best painter at things like this, but I just kept referencing the Pottery Barn version and did my best. Again, just make sure you have a lot of water in the paint, unless you want that more saturated look. I really like the uneven color. You could leave the candle holders just like this. They look beautiful, but the Pottery Barn version also had some paint splatter on them, which I wanted to add to mine as well. I wanted to make the blue darker for this part, so I added in even more black, but it doesn't look super different in the end. I wish it was a little bit darker, but I added even more water into the mix and I used my finger to flick the watercolor onto the pieces. The additional water really helps it to flow off the brush nicely. Lastly for this project, I wanted to get that high gloss finish, so I sprayed it with a satin sealer first. I didn't have a gloss spray sealer and didn't want the watercolor to smear if I had used a brush. But then I went back over top with a gloss Mod Podge. inspired by this beautiful clay bowl I found while scrolling through Pinterest and I'm using the polymer clay for this one. I'm not sure if this technique I'm going to show you would work with air dry clay though. I start making a big cylinder of white clay. Then I'm using this Sculpey clay in the color copper and rolling it out into a thin sheet. To get that colored edge around each clay circle on the bowl, you wanna cover the white cylinder with the copper or whatever colors that you choose. When you're working with this type of clay, it gets really warm and the warmer it is, the more bendable and moldable it is. So I'm gonna to need to cut this cylinder down, but first I'm going to put it in the freezer for 15 minutes. That will firm up the clay a bit and make it much easier to cut into while keeping its shape. When I took the clay out of the freezer, now I can start cutting it into thin slices to create the circles. Here you can see how each little circle will have that copper outline around it. If the clay starts getting too warm before you're done cutting it, just throw it back in the freezer for a few minutes, then keep going. Once I have all of the circles cut, I wanna add texture to them. So to do that, I'm taking a little scrap of burlap and lightly roll it over the pieces. 
Don't press too hard, but hard enough to see the lines. Next to make the shape, I grabbed a kitchen bowl and started adding the circles to it. When you add the circles on the bottom, it's no longer going to be flat. So to get a flat surface for the bowl to sit right on a table, I take my rolling pin again and roll over the circles on the bowl very lightly. Again, I don't want to distort the shape. I just want to make the bottom flat. Then continue adding the circles on around the sides of the bowl. When they were all on, I put it in the oven at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 minutes and then turned my oven off and let it cool down. I didn't think there was enough circles going up the sides of the bowl, so I made another log cylinder and cut out more to add on and then put it back in the oven. a large vessel and I don't love the straw like material that's wrapped around the top of it. It's also broken in an area so I'm going to remove this. I was able to easily cut through it with a utility knife and start peeling it off. Most of the straw came off with the help of a multi-tool to scrape it. However, there are some areas where the adhesive was pretty strong and I wasn't able to get everything off. I needed to break down the adhesive in order to get all that residue off. So to do this, I got out my goof off and a microfiber towel. I soaked the towel in the goof off and let that sit for a few minutes to break down the glue. I always forget to move my camera arm when I do shots like this. That's that little black thing that's hanging down and keeps covering my head. The goof off has had some time to soak in and break down that glue. I was able to scrape it away much easier now. Eventually I did get out a razor blade, which worked a little bit better than the multi-tool, but I had to work my way around section by section, letting it soak and then scrape it off. If you need to do something like this, make sure you work in a well-ventilated room. I had all of my doors and windows open. I added the slick stick onto the vessel and I just love this as a primer, so much better on objects like this. The Olive Atelier one I was inspired by had these decorative twists all around it. So I thought my four millimeter macrame cord would give that same look. I used hot glue and added about six pieces on going all the way down. Next, I'm gonna paint the surface and I want there to be texture to it, just like the old world vessels of my inspiration. A few months ago, I did a lime wash wall in my kitchen and I made my own lime wash paint. I'm using what I have left as my base coat, which is going to add a very natural looking texture to the vessel. I started out using a sponge brush, but I actually really don't like working with these sponges at all. Every time I think I'll give it another shot, I regret it. I kept going with this first layer, but ditched the sponge brush for the second. Anyways, I was applying the lime wash in almost a stippling motion at first, but again, I wasn't loving that. So after I got the whole thing covered, I went back over and kind of smoothed it out. I didn't want to lose the texture and pattern, so I did this unevenly and in crosshatch motions. And now this guy needs to dry. Lime wash paint dries about 90% lighter than how it goes on. And I thought it was a little bit too light. So I got out my natural pigment and added in some more color to it using natural umber. This time I'm also using a chippy brush to apply it. And I prefer this one any day over the sponge brush. It also gives more texture. I continued with that crosshatch pattern to apply the lime wash all over the vessel. While I love the rope that I added on the macrame because you can see that twist, which is really what the inspiration piece had. It was a lot larger, but you could really see that detail of the twisted look on the Olive Atelier pieces. So I have this Prima, redesigned by Prima mold here. And it has a similar like twist piece, or I could do a couple of different ones, but I think that's what I'm gonna go with. And I think I wanna add that on. A, it's gonna be a little bit bigger for the size vessel that we have here. And I think because once I added paint,
paint, the like lime wash paint over top. And we still have more work to do in making this look more aged. This is just gonna show up a lot better because the twist is kind of starting to fade in some areas as the paint is building up on top of it. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take these off. I just hot glued them on. Hopefully it's easy to just take them off, remove them. We are going to use some air dry clay and a mold, reapply it. We're gonna have to let that dry, unfortunately, and then go from there. The macrame off the vessel smoothed out where the hot glue was, and now I need to make all of the air dry clay twist pieces to add on. I'm using my DAS air dry clay. I really like this brand. Sculpey is another really good option. And then this redesigned by Prima silicone mold. You always wanna dust a mold with cornstarch before adding in the clay so it doesn't stick and you get a clean design. These molds are a little different from the IOD ones I like to use since they do not have that micro rim, which allows you to easily remove any excess clay. So for molds like this, I take a palette knife or something like it and run it along the top of the mold to remove the clay. I didn't get a great clip of how I was adding these pieces on, but I cut each end at an angle and that way it was a little easier to connect them together. Then I used my type on glue to attach them to the vessel. I added them on wet, otherwise they would have dried flat. There was some slight shrinkage while the clay dried, but I was able to fill that in with a tiny bit of spackle and you can't even tell. My clay has dried. You can't even tell where I added in some spackle to fill in any gaps. Now I need to paint the clay sections with the lime wash paint so it all has that same color. This was actually pretty difficult. The lime wash did not want to get into all of the clay dents and divots. I kept trying different style paintbrushes to get it on. So when you use lime wash paint, each layer you apply slightly changes the color and also the texture of the surface. Since I was getting this layer of the lime wash on the sections that were already painted as well, I went back over the whole thing randomly applying the lime wash so you wouldn't see those stripe sections around the clay where it was a little bit darker. I don't think this part mattered because we're gonna cover up the whole thing again anyways. However, you could also stop here and I think it looks beautiful just as it is. It was just too gray for me and didn't have enough age to it. So I went on to the next step. I'm using some acrylic paints and a sponge to layer on and get more of that aged patina. The first color I'm using is Cinnamon by Folk Art. The Olive Atelier pieces I was referencing had a terracotta looking base with some light aged areas on top. Another feature of Lime Wash is when it gets wet, the paint is reactivated. At first I was trying to avoid this and not wet my sponge too much, but I actually really liked how the areas were looking where I had wet the sponge a little bit more. Making anything look aged is a trust the process type of project, but projects like this usually always look kind of crazy and like a hot mess before they look good. There were plenty of times where I was seriously questioning what I was doing and I thought I had ruined the vessel, but I kept going, kept layering on the paint until I was happy with how it looked. It was difficult to get the sponge into all of the little crevices of the clay section, so I would use a detail brush or a chippy brush to apply the paint where needed. As I moved down the vessel, I started to add in some darker areas using Nutmeg and Burnt Umber by Apple Barrel. This started to add more depth to the piece. And again, that lime wash base layer helps to add some really interesting effects to the paint as it all dries. You could stop here as well, and this version is also beautiful and looks like aged terracotta, but it was a little bit too orange for me. So I decided to add in some more light tan over top. It really doesn't look tan as it dries. It's starting to look more gray, but I think this helps tone it down and bring it a little bit closer to my inspiration. I kept going back and forth with the darker and the lighter colors in hopes that it all melds together and look a little less splotchy than the previous version. While I liked how aged it looked, it was a little bit too busy. However, I didn't want any area to look too solid of one color. So I also took my sponge with the brown colors and very lightly dabbed it over here and there just to tie everything together. have to tell me which version you prefer. 
Even though I was really questioning how this would turn out, I'm so glad I kept on going with it. It is stunning and really gives that old world and aged vibe. You can style this simply like I have here with just an olive branch or add in some pompous grass for even more of that boho look. 